So, today we continue with the cell cell signaling. Remember in the last class we began with this uh, RTK. Um, so, we primarily you know learnt about uh, how the RAS GTP is you know GDP GTP exchange uh, helps in fine tuning the signal right only as long as the signal comes you will have the RAS GTP otherwise it is automatically becoming RAS GDP and inactive because of the actions of gap and the intrinsic hydrolysis activity right. So, we continue to other signalings. Uh, the next one is a small variation on RTK. Oh, okay. The RTK itself one more example. So this is um, so the, uh, this is just to illustrate that the RTK pathway ligands are diverse. Um, so here, for example, stem cell factor when it binds through uh, a receptor tyrosine kinase, uh, you know, receptor like uh, in the case of uh, melanocytes. Um, so, the receptor here is the kit which we have already seen as an example earlier right and MITF also we have seen as a, a, an example stereotype of a transcription factor right. So, that, so here you see the signal so you find the, uh, the red and the green so the color has not come out really up, uh, as red and green. So, what you are seeing here is actually uh, you see at least a white shade around the red. So, the red is actually one protein and the green is the other one that is MITF and KIT and when they both are there then they look whitish supposed to be uh, red and green and the overlap should be yellow. And you see that in these cells these are melanocytes ok. And in uh, kit knockout, uh, you do not see that. So, the migrating melanocytes uh, express this, and that is required for uh, uh, specification of the melanoblasts that are eventually going to become the pigment producing cells. Uh, and that is why you have skin color aberrations. So remember that uh, 4 lock of the mother and daughter in that MITF mutant. Okay. So, a small variation of that same pathway again this is uh, you know a similar receptor, but it is called uh, uh, Janus kinase. Uh, the difference here is the way the signal is transduced. So, the transducer is stat and this protein is transducer as well as that goes into the cytoplasm sorry nucleus to activate transcription. So, like here the signal transduction happens via a cascade of proteins involving finally, a couple of phosphorylation based regulation and then a phosphorylated protein gets into the nucleus right. So, the transducer if you take this adapter protein or GNRP they are not the one final effectors they are not the ones that go inside. While in jack stat pathway that molecule is directly the transducer is the one that directly gets into the nucleus and activates and as a result it is called signal transducer and activator of transcription stat stands for signal transduction and activator of transcription AT for activator of transcription and they dimerize and go inside and uh, activate um, downstream signaling. So, this sort of regulation works in the example of uh, casein gene in during uh, milk pro production you know prolactin binds to the receptor uh, and then that leads to uh, start activation. So, here is an example of a mutant condition. So, so here this uh, mutation in this extracellular domain of this uh, FGF. So, remember this entire thing is called FGF right fibroblast growth factor family uh, in that we saw RTK and now we are seeing STAT as a small variation on the same uh, group. So, when you have a mutation like this, this kinase domain remains constitutively active even when the signaling is not there. So, the receptor is constitutively active. And as a result, uh, these cells, these chondrocytes, prematurely differentiate 
without making enough of the starting material. Due to that the bones became short and you get this what is called thanatophoric dysplasia condition. Okay. So, this kind of highlights the importance of Jackstrad pathway in um, you know limb development and this is uh, lethal. Okay. So, this uh, lungs cannot expand and breathing is not possible. So, this is this will be dead on arrival. Okay. So, it is not going to be viable. Okay, so, the next one is uh, hedgehog pathway. Okay. So, each pathway has unique uh, characteristics in terms of how the signal is transduced and what kind of molecules are involved. So, therefore, it is not that hard to remember them and there are only 4 pathways. Um, so, the uniqueness about hedgehog is it is a protein signal that gets cleaved. Okay and only the N terminal portion is secreted out and that N terminal portion is cholesterol modified. So, you have encountered many post transcripts modifications particularly phosphorylation, methylation, acetylation these things you have already seen right. Uh, the last two I said are in histones. Uh, so, this is an example where cholesterol modification happens. I do not know any other example where cholesterol modification happens, but there are other lipid modifications are there prenylation, uh, palmitoylation. So, those kind of modulation uh, modifications are there, uh, sugar modifications are there, ADP rebosylation happens, uh, but this is one unique case where there is cholesterol modification. So, this cholesterol modified N terminal portion of the protein is the signal here. So, that is what is the hedgehog. So, this word hedgehog is based on the drosophila phenotype okay, where this was originally found and uh, in mouse the ortholog is called a sonic hedgehog. So, this is a whole mount uh, embryo in, in situ showing expressions uh, three tissues are specifically marked. So, you have in the nervous system and you have in the limbs and then this is the gut region. Okay, so, three arrows showing where they are expressed. So, these are usually important for um, tissue boundary making. Okay. So, boundaries are defined primarily using this signaling. It is required for limb development and neural differentiation as well. Okay. Um, so, involved in somite differentiation uh, uh, you know to make uh, the cartilage out of uh, dorsal part of the somites. So, the ventral sorry from the ventral part dorsal will be by the next signaling wind. So, let us look at how this pathway is. Um, so, I will tell you something which will be catchy and then we will come to the pathway. Yeah, look at this picture right. This is called a cyclop not a Greek mythology real life. So, there is there are some plants that grow in some parts of the world like in um, Arizona, California etcetera and they produce certain molecules called uh, an alkaloid called gervin or uh, opamines like cyclopamine. And if the um, sheep eats this uh, and uh, you know when the when it is uh, when her offspring comes out it will have problem in development. So, these uh, alkaloids they inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis as a result enough cholesterol is not produced during the embryonic development and due to that you have craniofacial development problem. The brain both uh, you know the three parts of the brain do not form the separation and they form a few structure due to that you develop one eye and due to that it is called cyclop. Okay. So, this illustrates the developmental importance of cholesterol. So, if anyone says cholesterol is bad you remain them you would not be alive without cholesterol okay, simply because you eat the wrong food and wrong quantity at the wrong time and do not do physical exercise do not blame the molecules. Now that you have seen the consequence you will be very much interested in how the pathway works. This pathway again works like uh, you know the accelerator pedal in car there is negative regulation. So, normally you will have uh, this uh, cupitus interruptus. This is attached to microtubules via these cos 2 and fused 2 fused and when it is like that this PKA and slim they would cleave this 
only when it is attached to microtubule via these two proteins. And the cleaved part of uh, uh, CI goes inside and acts as a repressor. This is what normally it does. And whenever you have Hedgecock binding to this transmembrane receptor called patched, which otherwise keeps the other membrane bound protein in a repressed condition, okay, smoothened. So, these are again based on the Drosophila embryonic uh, phenotype. So, when Hedgecock binds, this inhibition is released, and due to that, the smoothen inhibits these two proteins. So, people still do not know clearly the molecular mechanisms involved in it. So, the end result is these two are inhibited, one. Second, that smoothened by phosphorylating these two proteins, uh, COS2 and FUSE2, releases CI uh, from the microtubules. And now the CA is not cleaved because these two are um, suppressed. It translocates and then it recruits a protein called CBP and it becomes an activator. It is no longer a repressor. Instead, it becomes an activator. So, this is how the Hedgecock response genes are activated. Okay, this is how this pathway works. So, here the uniqueness is uh, you know this these molecules, these are specific to this pathway, and then you have this. Uh, cholesterol modification. So, that is how you can recollect this and will not get confused with uh, the other pathways. All right. So, the next one is wind signaling. So, wind actually the word comes from uh, wingless which is a phenotype of a drosophila mutant um, and uh, integrated which is a vertebrate uh, ortholog. So, both together it is called wind. I think the vertebrate ortholog was first found in Xenopus. Um, so, these are uh, glycoproteins that are rich in cysteine. So, they are important for the dorsal somates to become muscle. So, the ventral one become cartilage through the action of uh, hedgehog and the dorsal ones become muscle through the action of wind and it is required for specification of midbrain uh, again uh, limb development. So, this is again involved in limb development like the other ones like jack stud we saw. Then proliferation of stem cells in certain contexts and more uh, dramatically for the urogenital system. Okay. It is also required for female sex determination. So, we will look at how this works. So, this actually it is a family of proteins there are several molecules that are wind and similarly there are several molecules that are its receptor frizzled receptor and the which one of the member uh, activates depends on which one is expressed in a given tissue. Okay. Um, there are several wind like molecules similarly there are several frizzled like receptors. So, which one is going to be the ligand it depends on which ligand is expressed in a tissue where a given receptor family member is expressed that is one. And second due to that there is, there is a divergence like you have three different modes of wind signaling we will see that okay, two slides later. So, before that again like that cyclop um, because this will catch your attention. So, this is again. Um, you know an embryonic uh, kidney testis part that is uh, stained uh, you know in situ hybridization for the wind 4 RNA and then you find it uh, this purple color is the expression part and it is expressed in the kidney rudiment strongly. And if you do a knockout of wind 4, so these are the wild type age matched same magnification kidneys adrenal gland on the top, gonad at the bottom and so on. And in the knockout adrenal gland is intact, gonad is intact, but the kidney has become too tiny. So, kidney does not form, so the nephrons do not develop. So, so, wind signaling is required for this. So, there are three different ways by which wind works. Uh, the first one was the first to be described and as a result this is called the Typical in the western world they often call canonical meaning which is like the textbook classic example. So, many of the students in India do not immediately understand canonical because that word comes from uh, you know church uh, based uh, you know canon means something that is said and there 
and you are doing anything other than that is non canonical. So, the first defined pathway therefore, is called the canonical and the ones discovered later are called non canonical. So, the, the first discovered one has this sequence where you have this metabolic enzyme you know glycogen synthase kinase that one uh, usually is associated with uh, APC which usually targets it for degradation. Uh, this is a tumor suppressor okay, um, involved in colorectal cancer and beta catenin you already know where did we encounter beta catenin? Catagrain okay, catagrain to act in connection is via catenins right. So, it is the same catenin. So, all of them have other uh, roles to play ok. So, this is one function here. So, I am trying to talk about that that is just to highlight the point that these molecules are not dedicated doing only this one job and therefore, uh, the dynamics of their concentration will depend on many factors in the cell ok, not their role in wind signaling or their role in glycogen synthesis or um, regulating cell adhesion by modifying actin and catagrain uh, dynamics. So, anyway, so this GSK3 APC they target beta catenin for degradation and as a result uh, you do not have beta catenin going in and activating um, uh, you know anything inside. But when you have wind binding to the frizzled receptor again transmembrane receptor and the transducer disabled gets activated that is going to suppress the GSK3. And now beta catenin is not going to be cleaved and it will migrate into the nucleus and associate with this factor and activate transcription ok. So, that is how this works. So, again normal is negative. So, th this is just to fine tune only when the signal is there you are going to have that activation and the moment signal is off it is off. There is no you know um, comet like halo effect here <laughs> there is no trailing thing. And a small variation of this happens at the disabled level if the signal is transduced by a disabled protein that is uh, you know tethered to the plasma membrane via this prickle uh, protein, then it is going to activate this rho GTPase. We have learnt about rho GTPase right where in morphogenesis right. So, ventral furrow formation, neural tube the neural cells to imaginate inside for all of that I said modifying actin by the small molecules like GTPase that is the rho GTPase. So, rho GTPase similarly another one rack that is also small GTPase. So, when these are activated they are going to alter the cytoskeletal. So, directly without gene expression change you will have changes to the cytoskeleton when it is transduced this way. In addition they do via JNK uh, control gene expression as well. And a third version is um, branching even earlier than disabled. So, to an unknown protein which transduces that is going to activate a phospholipase C and uh, that is going to cause calcium release from ER and that is going to have transcription activation based on calcium mediated uh, signal transduction ok. So, these are three different versions by which wind signaling works ok. The next one is a mega family ok, it is it is a super family having multiple families inside this is called TGF beta ok. And um, so, here the uh, ligand is actually the carboxy terminal that that is the mature form ok, the carb carboxy terminal is cleaved and secreted out that is that is what is the TGF beta and that dimerizes and then going to bind to the ligand sorry receptor. So, it is required for extracellular matrix very soon you will see the importance of extracellular matrix in development 
uh, then branching of epithelia to form ducts of kidneys, lungs, salivary glands like wherever you need to have epithelium to tube formation. Um, it is required for bone development one, one of the family uh, bone morphogenetic factor this BMP here you see this and they were originally discovered for their ability to uh, promote bone formation. Okay. Um, this DPP one of the BMP member in Drosophila is required for uh, uh, germline stem cell maintenance without that they would not remain as uh, stem cells instead they will enter into meiosis. Okay. So, there will be no stem cells without that. Uh, they are required for cell division, apoptosis regulation in many vertebral contexts, uh, cell migration as well. Um, so, like that they are involved in um, you know many different processes. So, they work in this manner. Um, so, you have uh, the ligand here we are looking at two different ligands uh, active in binding to it. So, you have type 2 and type 1 two kinds of uh, receptors they dimerize when they bind to the ligand and the type 2 autophosphorylates and then phosphorylates type 1 and that becomes the active version and that active version is transduced by the phosphorylation of SMAD pro proteins. So, small for small worm okay, they, the worms are about a half the size of the normal ones they are really cute and nice. Okay. Uh, they are thin and small so they are not like dumpy. So, so small and mad I think mad is uh, I forgot the name maybe mothers against drunk drivers or whatever. So, that is in Drosophila so they name crazy names. <laughs> okay. So, both combined is mad okay. so it is small and mad common smad. So, in vertebrates they simply call smads. So, smad 2, smad 5, smad 1 and so on. So, if it is active in it is smad 2, 3 that gets phosphorylated that associates with smad 4 and that complex goes in and activates transcription. Instead if it is BMP it is going to be smad 1 and 5 instead of 2 and 3 that is the only difference and then that is going to associate with smad 4 and go and activate transcription. So, this is how TGF beta works. Okay, so, they it is a family of families okay, so therefore, it is a super family. So, you have a lot of members and uh, they, they are really really critical molecules um, in uh, almost all organismal developments. Okay. So, the last one which is not those four main pathways, but this is again critical pathway this is called apoptosis. Okay. So, it is quite simple pathway. So, already you know the story that in cell lineage tracing I told you in C. elegans uh, you can trace the entire lineage from starting from P0 and in that process people discovered 131 cells die always. So, 959 plus 131 is how many whatever that number is what is produced normally in that 131 die for sure and the remaining become the normal worm. And this invariant uh, you know lineage tracing of those 131 is what convinced people that there must be an intrinsic developmental program that makes a cell to die. So, now we actually know uh, in many organisms all cells are actually default is to die there is somebody who has to tell no you are not going to die and that is how they live. Okay. So, so that is how it works. For example, here uh, if Z9 is not holding on to Z4, okay, it is going to dimerize and become active and uh, associate with this protease okay, Z3 who is the executioner they call it executioner in that field you know cell death in C elegans. Um, yeah. So, it is going to be cleaved and active protease and this is going to chew up all the proteins and DNA and kill that cell okay. that is what will happen if Z9 is not holding Z4. So, in the normal situation a cell that is not supposed to die there Z9 holds on to Z4 
and any time you get this signal eagle 1 meaning egg laying defective ok. Uh, so, that is going to compete with uh, Z4 to bind Z9 therefore, Z4 is released and that goes on to activate Z3. So, this is how it looks in C elegance it is easy to find apoptotic cells uh, these two images were taken by me by the way. Um, th this is a uh, very early larval germ line you have two rows of germ cells this is how normal nuclei look like and when they are going to commit suicide they become button shaped like this ok and this is very distinct morphology you do not need to come from Bob Harvitz lab to identify it. So, I could identify it and when I asked them are they really apoptotic they said yes for sure they are apoptotic cells. So, we did use uh, vital dyes that specifically stain apoptotic cells therefore, you are confident that you are doing the right stuff. Anyway, this is apoptotic pathway. So, we discussed how this was originally discovered. So, now in C elegans probably this pathway just started sculpting organism shape and uh, if you failed to do it, it was still ok the worm does not die like for example, set 3 homozygous mutants are viable normal no problem with those few extra cells they are fine, but not so in your case you would not be born. So, this is how your head will look like this wild type mouse this is uh, Z9 knockout which is equal to Z3 ok caspase 9 sorry. So, caspase is a protease um, this caspase 9 and Z4 uh, wait wait which one ok this Z4 and APAF1 these are interchangeable you can uh, get rid of Z4 and put the human APAF1 in C elegans it will rescue the phenotype in C elegans. So, these are core conserved pathway over few hundred million years. So, you will produce lot more neurons and they will stay there your proper brain will not be formed ok and this digit separation will not happen this will be webbed. So, eventually embryo will be dead. So, this is a cross section through its uh, brain area and you see this uh, ventricle and the wall here the wall is thickened and you do not even see that space ok. So, it is lethal in uh, vertebrates and this is the pathway in the two different contexts and the orthologs are you uh, colored similarly like eagle 1 equivalent is this big box BCL 2 is the Z 9 and APAF 1 is the Z 4 and caspase 9 and 3 are the Z 3 equivalent ok. So, these are the C elegans and this is the mammalian neurons and mutations in this obviously will cause cancer as well. Like for example, cells that are not adhering to a surface where they should normally adhere they are actually activated to commit suicide by apoptosis and if that fails if any of this fail in this pathway then those cells will not die instead they will become metastatic cancer. So, there there is lot of uh, cancer situations where the mutation is actually on genes involved in this pathway. So, ok so we are done with that uh, the next one that we are going to look at the really lost signaling. So, these are in addition to those four ok only couple of them one is apoptosis uh, very easy pathway right only you have um, Z9, Z4, Z3 that is all you need to remember eagle 1 in between you have to bring in for that activation. So, otherwise that pathway is straight forward um, actually none of them are complicated all of them are easy to remember you just need to look at it multiple times. So, the next one we are going to look at is not paracrine. So, so far whatever we were seeing uh, like the four main ones they are paracrine. So, the more receptor sorry the ligand is secreted out and uh, they bind to the receptor on cells at some distance not very far away like the way endocrine uh, system works. Uh, but the next one that we are going to see is called juxtacrine where the ligand and receptor are membrane bound and therefore, the cells have to be physically adjacent to each other. So, the drosophila names have stuck 
uh, in the literature more popularly and that is the receptor is notch uh, and the ligand is delta. Okay. So, officially it is called LIN 12 notch signaling because LIN 12 was the first notch like receptor uh, discovered. Um, so, we already know uh, did we encounter LIN 12? Yes, we did in vulval development. We will refresh our memory once more. Involved in uh, vulva development, what does LIN 12 do in uh, vulva development? So, when the primary fate cell wants to suppress primary fate on the two adjacent cells, lateral yes lateral signaling uh, to make the secondary fate. Okay, in the context of uh, lateral signaling is a generic uh, description of that class, in that context it is to uh, induce the secondary fate. So, that is how in vulva development it is involved. It is required for fly eye development, retinal development in fly. Uh, in vertebrate nervous system to tell a cell do not become neuron instead you become glial cell that is done by the uh, notch signal. <laughs> and um, yeah in optic neuron specifically. Um, so, that is where this is involved. So, here the interaction leads to cleavage of the notch. So, usually there are three cleavages one uh, first of all it does not exist as a single polypeptide it is made a single polypeptide, but on its uh, route to the membrane via ER and Golgi. In Golgi it gets cleaved and it becomes um, two polypeptides, but attached to each other non covalently therefore, it is like a heterodimer and that is what is uh, embedded in the membrane that is S1 cleavage. Then the S2 cleavage happens extracellularly only upon delta interaction and that cleavage triggers an intramembrane cleavage by a protein called presenilin okay, or cell 10 cell 12 in C elegans SEL 12. So, that presenilin cleavage releases the cytoplasmic domain and that is the active uh, notch that is the transducer that goes inside and associates with the uh, CSL. I would not attempt to recollect all of them, uh, L is lag 1 C elegans protein. So, I know it S and C are uh, drosophila names I do not remember them uh, right now. Okay. Um, so, that association with that transcription factor activates the downstream targets. So, that is how notch delta transduces the signaling. So, essentially here the exciting thing about this molecule is the receptor undergoes three proteolytic cleavages, one before going to the membrane, another one extracellular cleavage and another one intracellular intramembrane cleavage, then the active molecule translocates into the nucleus. Okay. So, this is how it works. So, the signaling is easy. But we have a complex model to explain how this finally contributes to development. Okay. So, there we are going back to vulva for a short time, vulva even little earlier than vulva also we will go to understand that. So, we already know RTK pathway the anchor cell through the RTK pathway is going to make this cell become primary fate. Okay. Uh, now, this is going to prevent the two adjacent cells in every way they are equal in terms of their positioning. So, they are called equivalence group that is another key word you need to remember equivalence group means cells that have equivalent potential in terms of developmental possibilities okay, what fate they can assume. So, these are equivalence group cells and the LIN 12 signaling between P6 P and P 7 P and P 6 P and P 5 P tells them not to become primary fate and they become the secondary. And the ones that are farther away they do not get any of this news and therefore, they go defaulted to become hypodermis because someone else is telling them do not become vulva. Remember that uh, negative signaling by LIN 50. So, as a result they become hypodermis. So, now how this signaling happens 
has been understood before this developmental stage at the stage of anchor cell formation. So, there again the anchor cell and its uh, sister they both are equivalence group. They are called ZERT1 dot AAA and ZERT4 dot PPP. Do you understand what that means? It was the anterior 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 daughter. Similarly, in the other one when Z4 divides posterior 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 great granddaughter of Z4 on the posterior side. Okay. So, those two cells are like this v P7 P and P5 P they are in identical situation. One of them can become so that is illustrated here. Okay. So, one of them is going to become ventral uterine precursor cell you need to make the uterus right. So, the ventral part of it requires this cell. Of the sister of anchor cell and the other one is going to become anchor cell. So, either one can be either one of the two fates okay. both are capable of becoming anchor cell both are capable of becoming ventral uterine precursor. So, the student and the mentor who figured out this so they did lot of ablations mosaic analysis to ensure which molecule is in which cell through all of this they figured out the ligand receptor are both produced by the both the cells and finally, they put together this model that is totally by random chance if one of them ends up producing uh, a little bit more uh, ligand okay, ends up telling the other one to produce more receptor and produce uh, less ligand and that is a initial difference between purely by chance then that initial difference is reinforced by feedback. So, here you see both uh, this is the uh, signal this is the receptor both are producing both. If one is producing a little bit of uh, more of the you know receptor and another one producing more of the ligand this ligand producing cell is going to tell the receptor cell not to produce ligands instead produce receptor and that ends up in this difference. Then finally, one becomes anchor cell another becomes ventral uterine precursor. So, this is the model proposed to explain how fate determination might work among equivalence group cells uh, via the notch delta pathway in different contexts. This is probably how one cell becomes neuron another becomes glial if you want to think in vertebrate context. Okay. So, this brings us to the end of the um, signaling pathways.